In this video, I'm going to cover intermolecular forces. So um, geckos are creatures that can climb up walls, kind of like insects can. And um, with a gecko, that's a bit surprising maybe because they're a bit more heavy than insects are. Um, and what, what causes, what allows a gecko to be able to climb up a wall um, and even onto a ceiling is not necessarily that their feet are sticky. Their feet don't feel like, um, like glue or tape. Uh, the, the attraction that the feet have to the wall is more like static electricity. Like if you've ever used um, a balloon and you've rubbed a balloon on your hair, that balloon is sticky to your shirt, right? It sticks. It's, it's an electrical attraction. So that static electricity that, that allows a balloon to stick to your shirt, that's the same kind of idea, the same kind of attraction that allows a gecko's feet to stick to a wall. And the, um, what, the reason that their feet can do that and our feet cannot is because their feet have little tiny structures. So you can see right here, they zoom in on the hand, and here's a picture of the zoomed in hand, and then they're going to zoom in on this section of the finger. Here's a zoomed in section of that finger, and then they're going to zoom in on this piece here, and then that's this structure here, and they're going to zoom in on one of these setae here, and, they, and this is a zoomed in picture of the setae, and now they're going to zoom in on just the tip of the setae there, and then they call those spatulae, and the point is that you can see that the structure on this level, we can see that there's a lot of pieces to the foot. When we get even closer, we can see that those pieces look like hairs. And when we get even closer to those hairs, we can see that the, what look like individual hairs themselves are actually made up of even smaller hairs. When we zoom in on those, we can see that they're even smaller hairs. So there are so many little tiny structures that there's an, a lot of surface area. Each one of those hairs has an amount of surface area. And when there are millions and millions and millions like this, then there's so much surface area that a gecko's hand has a lot of surface area. And so this, uh, this um, force that allows a gecko to stick to the wall is called dispersion, a dispersion force. And a dispersion force is a, a force, an attractive force that particles have that, that occurs between particles. Um, not just gecko's feet and the wall, but all particles ex, uh, can um, exhibit a dispersion force. So the more surface area there is on the gecko's feet, the stronger the dispersion force is. So there are three phases of water, obviously, um, solid, liquid, and gas. And we know that in a solid, all of the particles are stuck. They can't really move. And in a liquid, the particles are still kind of sticky and they move around a little bit more. And in a gas, the particles don't stick together and they bounce off each other and they can fill up the entire space of the container. So um, the, what state a material is in, whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, depends on two major factors. The amount of kinetic energy the particles possess and that's what we focused on so far. Things that are cold are generally solids, and when we warm those things up, they turn into liquids, and when we warm them up even more, they turn into gases. So heat is, um, when we add heat to a sample, we're increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. Heat makes them go faster, and when they go faster, they go from solid to liquid to gas. So the other thing that we haven't focused on is the strength of the attraction between the particles. Why are some things solid at room temperature, but some things are liquid. They have a similar amount of kinetic energy because they're both at the same temperature. They're both at room temperature, so the particles have on average the same amount of kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy is the same, why is one a solid and one a liquid, and even some things are gases at room temperature? Well, that has to do with differences in the strength of attraction between the particles. So molecules in a gas have complete freedom of motion. So that means that they, their kinetic energy is so high, they're moving so quickly that um, they, even though they, the particles might have some attractive force, they might be sticky to each other, they're moving so quickly that they overcome that stickiness. Molecules in a solid are locked in place and they cannot move around. So particles in a solid have very, very low kinetic energy, which means the particles are moving very slowly. So if particles are sticky and they're moving really slowly, then they can't get away from each other. So they're stuck in place. 
and in a liquid they're kind of in between so in a liquid they're moving fast enough to break apart from their neighbor but they can't break apart from the whole sample so they're all kind of stuck together they can just kind of move around um, within the liquid a bit more they can kind of uh, move uh, through the sample they're not stuck in place so if I obviously add kinetic energy then we can change the sample we can change a sample from a solid to a liquid to a gas but what temperature that change occurs at has to do with differences in intermolecular forces differences in the attraction between particles for example oxygen is a gas at room temperature but water is a liquid at room temperature um, so different substances have different um, properties as uh, which is a function of their the strength of their intermolecular forces so um, an intermolecular force is very similar to the forces that hold atoms together so what holds an, the atoms together in a bond in a molecule the, the atoms that are held together in a bond are held together because this nucleus is plus this nucleus is plus and these electrons are negative so the negative um, charge holds together the positive charges plus is attracted to minus so those are called intramolecular forces those are covalent bonds ionic bonds the bonds that hold atoms together but the bonds that hold molecules together the bond that holds this water molecule to this water molecule that's called an intermolecular force intra inter so um, intermolecular forces are very similar to intramolecular forces in that they are also um, based on negative charge being attracted to positive charge so the larger the charge the stronger the attraction so let's look at the first uh, um, intermolecular force the first intermolecular force is called dispersion this is the weakest force so in dispersion this is a helium atom I know this is a helium atom because it has two protons and two neutrons and two electrons so being that helium is a gas um, even down almost to absolute zero means that the particles are don't have very much attraction for each other we can take the kinetic energy all the way down to absolute zero so that there the particles have almost zero kinetic energy and at that point we can turn helium into a liquid but up until very close to absolute zero helium is just a gas the whole time so that says that helium particles are not very sticky they are there is not a very big attractive force between helium particles but there must be some attractive force between helium particles because when I get them down to zero they turn into a liquid they wouldn't turn into a liquid unless they were sticky to each other so they stick together when they get really 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 cold so what causes helium atoms to stick together it's called the dispersion force and it's the same force that helps the geckos feet stick to the wall so let's see how this works so in a helium atom a helium atom is neutral um, so two neutral atoms are not sticky to each other this atom is not sticky to this atom because they're both neutral there's no plus and there's no minus there's no magnets to stick them together right so remember plus is attracted to minus but neutral is not attracted to neutral so if helium atoms are neutral then how do they, how are they attracted to each other well there's this force here that's called um, this this situation is called instantaneous dipole so here's the two electrons in helium one's above the nucleus one's below the nucleus so they're pretty much spread out here's the two electrons in it frame two I'm kinda like a strobe light I look at it at this moment I look at it at this moment I look at it at this moment so at this moment they're pretty much one above one below they cancel out one over here to the right one over here to the left they cancel out at this moment they're both over here on the left and there's no electrons over here on the right so what that means is at this moment in time it's just an instant in this one instant the electrons are both on this side of the atom and in that one instant this side of the atom has some extra negative charge because all of the negative electrons are over there and this side of the atom is missing negative charge so it's positive so 
we can say that this is partial positive, just like a dipole, and this is, or excuse me, partial negative, and this is partial positive, just like a dipole. So in this one instant, this particle does have a charge, but in the next instant, the charge goes away. In the next instant, there's no charge. In the next instant, no charge, no charge, no charge, no charge. And then all of a sudden, there's a charge there again. And then in the next instant, the charge goes away. So this is just a spontaneous event that just randomly happens. Sometimes it happens, and then it goes away. And then it happens again, and it goes away. Because the electrons are moving randomly, and so sometimes randomly, they end up at the, on the same side of the nucleus. So when that happens for one instant, this, um, this atom right here, for one instant, has a negative side to it and a positive side to it. So in that one instant, the atom that's right next to this one says, oh, hey, there's a positive charge right here. Then the electrons on this atom get sucked over towards the positive charge. And when those electrons from this atom get sucked over toward that positive charge, then there's a positive charge on, on this side of the atom. So then that positive charge, there's electrons on the, its neighbor, and the electrons on its neighbor all get pulled over to this side because they're all attracted to this positive charge here. So you can see that in one instant, a dipole moment is formed. In one instant, this particle becomes charged. And because in that one instant it is charged, its neighbor's electrons move. And then its neighbor's electrons move. And then its neighbor's electrons move. And then in the next instant, this disappears, and then they all disappear. And then suddenly, they're not attracted to each other anymore. So this dispersion force is very random, and it's very weak, and it's very fleeting. You can see it's there in one instant, and it's gone in the next instant. So sometimes this is called instantaneous dipole, because in one instant, there's a dipole formed on this particle. And in the next instant, that creates a dipole in this particle. So sometimes we say instantaneous dipole, induced dipole, induced dipole. So in that one instant, all of those particles are stuck together. And in the next instant, they're not. And in the next instant, another group of particles is stuck together. And in the next instant, they're not. And then the next instant, another group of particles is stuck together. So this is the way in which helium atoms are sticky by the, dis by the dispersion force, which is not very sticky at all. So the size of the induced dipole has to do with a couple of factors. The polarizability of the electrons, which means how big is the electron shell. If we're talking about helium, those electrons are really, really close to the nucleus. That's a really small electron shell. Helium only has two electrons. So here's the nucleus, and here are the two electrons right next to the nucleus. But if we're talking about xenon, Xenon has a nucleus, and one shell, and two shells, and three shells, and four shells, and five shells. Right? So um, helium is small, it has a small electron cloud, but uh, xenon has a huge electron cloud. All of these are negative, 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 all of these electrons and all of these clouds. Right? So the larger the cloud is, the more polarizable it is. And polarizable just means um, the uh, higher the likelihood that those electrons can move from one side of the atom to the other side of the atom. So when an atom is big, it's easy to move those electrons from one side to the other. Because the electrons way out here are not held very tightly to the nucleus, because there's so many shells of electrons that the ones on the outside are held very loosely. So it's easy for them to move from one side to the other. But here, these electrons are held very close to the nucleus. It's not easy for them to move from one side to the other. And so helium is not very polarizable. Xenon is very polarizable. So helium has a smaller dispersion force because the electrons are less likely to move around in helium. They're really stuck to the nucleus. Xenon has a larger dispersion force. That means xenon atoms are stickier to each other. That means that xenon is going to turn into a liquid much sooner than zero Kelvin, much sooner than absolute zero. The particles are stickier. They have higher polarizability. So another factor that affects um, 
the, the size of the induced dipole is the shape of the molecule. So some molecules are spherical and some molecules are uh, kind of cigar shaped. So here's the first, we were, um, the first example. Helium is small, it has, it's not very polarizable. Its boiling point is four Kelvin. That's when it turns into a liquid. Xenon is much bigger. Its uh, boiling point, when it turns into a liquid, is 165 Kelvin. So there's a huge, these are all noble gases, which means that none of them are very sticky, but as they get bigger and they become more polarizable, then their boiling points go up because they get stickier and stickier because they're, the forces between the particles get bigger. Also, as the, as the molar mass increases, the number of electrons increases. And as the number of electrons increases, then the particle becomes more polarizable. And here's an example of what happens um, when we have different shaped molecules. In these molecules, they have a dispersion force. Every particle has a dispersion force. So particles that are not polar have dispersion. Particles that are polar have dispersion. Every particle in the universe experiences the dispersion force, every atom and every molecule. So when I'm looking at the dispersion force experienced by these molecules, between these molecules, when they're spheres, there's a very small area where they interact with each other. So the dispersion force that's experienced between spherical molecules is small. But look at these kind of cigar-shaped molecules. When they're more cigar-shaped, then they have a lot more surface to interact with each other. There's a larger surface for interaction, so there's a larger uh, dispersion force. The dispersion force is stronger in cigar-shaped cigar molecules than it is in spherical molecules. Now these, at, these molecules have exactly the same number of atoms. One, two, three, four, five carbons, three, six, eight, 10, 12 hydrogens. Three, six, nine, 12 hydrogens, five carbons. So C5H12, they're both C5H12, but the spherical shaped C5H12, where I put them together like this, they're all stuck to the central carbon. That has a, a higher boiling point, excuse me, a lower boiling point than uh, the particles that have, that are more cigar shaped where all of the atoms are stuck in a chain. So the larger area for interaction, the more dispersion those particles feel. And if they feel more dispersion, they're stickier. And if they're stickier, then they're going to have a higher boiling point. And if they're not as sticky, they're going to have a lower boiling point. So we can see that here. Here's cigar-shaped pentane, C5. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, then the boiling point goes up. OK, the next, um, the next intermolecular force is experienced by particles that are polar. So dispersion, all particles. And since nonpolar particles don't have any other attraction, for nonpolar particles, dispersion is the only force. Only force. in nonpolar particles. The dipole-dipole interaction is only in polar molecules. So nonpolar molecules do not have a dipole-dipole interaction, but polar molecules have a dipole-dipole interaction and they have dispersion. Every particle has dispersion. Only polar particles have dipole-dipole. So here's how dipole-dipole works. It's the same idea. Plus is attracted to minus. 
the positive end of one particle is attracted to the negative end of another particle. Now when I look at the helium atoms, we saw these same symbols, positive, partial, po excuse me, partial positive, partial negative. And see the positive side of one particle is attracted to the negative side of another particle, plus attracted to minus, just like magnets. The difference between this dispersion and dipole-dipole is that this plus and minus that exists on this helium atom is temporary. The plus and the minus goes away. It is not permanently there. It's there for an instant and then it disappears. It's an instantaneous dipole. The plus and the minus is random as the electrons move around. In a molecule that's polar, the plus and the minus is always there. It's a permanent dipole because the plus and the minus comes from the electronegativity difference between carbon and oxygen. Oxygen takes the electrons away from carbon, so oxygen is partial minus and carbon is partial plus. So um, all of these attractive forces all have to do with plus and minus being attracted to each other. Just like in a covalent bond is about plus and minus, protons being attracted to electrons. So it's always about plus and minus. That's what makes particles sticky. The difference is where is how big the positive and negative charge is. In a helium atom, the positive and negative charge is really small because it's only there for an instant. In a molecule that's polar, the positive and negative charge is bigger because that dipole moment makes those positive and negative charges permanent. So then this negative side of this molecule is attracted to the positive side of this molecule and they get stuck together. So how do we know how this, when is this is going to happen? Well, like I just said, there has to be a polar bond. So C is 2.5 and O is 3.5 in electronegativity, C, O, 2.5, 3.5. So that means that the dipole moment goes this way and the dipole moment goes this way, points at the more electronegative atom. So that means that this is negative, and it means that the carbon down here is positive. So if I can look at a molecule and find a dipole moment because of a difference in the electronegativity, then I know that there's a negative end and a positive end. And if that's a polar molecule and the dipole moments do not cancel out, there is no dipole moment down here, there is no dipole moment down here. This is the only dipole moment in this molecule. So if the dipoles don't cancel out and this turns out to be a polar molecule, then the negative side of this dipole is attracted to the positive side of this dipole. Here's um, an example of how the dipole-dipole force is stronger than the dispersion force. In this molecule, ethane, there is no polar bond. C, carbon is, oops, carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5 and hydrogen is 2.1. So the difference here is 0 0.4, which is nonpolar. So CH bonds are nonpolar bonds. So this molecule does not have any polar bonds. They're all nonpolar. So if it doesn't have any polar bonds, then it doesn't have any dipole moments, and it doesn't have a dipole-dipole attraction. Therefore, the only force, the only attractive force that this molecule, and all nonpolar molecules, in fact, the only force that they have is dispersion. So what holds this molecule to its friends? Dispersion. So its boiling point is negative 88 degrees. Its mass is 30. Here is a molecule that has the same mass, 30. They're almost identical. But this molecule has a dipole moment. It has a dipole moment that points this way, towards the O and away from the C. So that means that this molecule has a partial minus and a partial plus. So since this molecule is polar, it has a dipole-dipole attraction. So generally, particles that are the same mass have the same boiling point, unless they have a different intermolecular force. So this is really dispersion, has a boiling point of negative 88, 
and this is dipole dipole same mass and the boiling point is about 70 degrees higher so this boils at a much higher temperature than this does so that means that these particles are much stickier when something boils that means they turn from a liquid to a gas turning from a liquid to a gas means the particles are no longer stuck together they're sticky when they're a liquid they're not sticky when they're a gas so the boiling point the temperature at which something turns from a liquid to a gas is how when we can say that those particles are no longer sticky we've the kinetic energy that we have added has overcome all attractive forces. So the boiling points of these particles are 70 degrees different, which means that these are much stickier. They, they resist boiling for much longer, for 70 degrees more. So that means that the dipole-dipole force is stronger than the dispersion force. Here's, we can see that manifested in these boiling points. Here is another example. All of these particles, well, um, all of the particles on up have a dipole moment. One way that we can see that, oops, one way that we can see that is because they all have an oxygen in them, and carbon-oxygen bonds are polar. This one has nitrogen. Carbon-nitrogen bond is polar. And also, if we look at the electrostatic potential map, when you see red and blue, I guess it's harder to see the blue here, but the red is indicating that there's a separation of charge. The red is negative. So we can see that all of these electrostatic potential maps have a red part, which means that that part's negative, which means there must be a positive part. So these are all polar molecules. The red part of one molecule is attracted to the blue part of another molecule. This one is just uh, dispersion. So you can see all of these particles have the same mass or very similar mass, but as they become more and more and more polar, the boiling point goes up. This one has a very high boiling point, even though it has the lowest mass because it's the stickiest, because it is the most polar, has the highest, posit the largest positive and negative charge. Okay, finally, um, we'll look at hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force. It's even stronger than dipole-dipole. But you can see it's very similar. The positive side of one molecule is attracted to the negative side of another molecule. They're all like that. All of the attractive forces are plus attracted to minus. Again, the difference is the size of the plus and minus. In dispersion, the plus and minus is really small because it's instantaneous. In dipole-dipole, the plus and minus is a little bit bigger because that's a permanent dipole. And in hydrogen bonding, the plus and minus is even bigger because um, oxygen is a very, very electronegative atom. So there are a couple of necessary components for hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen is one of them, obviously. So we have to have hydrogen atoms in a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond, this is kind of like a super dipole. So dipole moments, dipole-dipole interaction makes particles pretty sticky. But this is the same kind of force, but it's even bigger. So it's kind of like a super dipole-dipole force. It's kind of like what hydrogen bonding is. And so in order to make this super dipole, we need to have specific atoms. There has to be a hydrogen. And the hydrogen has to be attached to an O or an N, or an F. That's it. These are the only bonds that can participate in hydrogen bonding. Any other bond that happens to be polar but is not one of these three bonds, it's a dipole-dipole force. It is not a hydrogen bond. But if we're talking about these three bonds, they are, those three bonds are special. And they're so, they have such a strong intermolecular force that we call it something different. We call it hydrogen bonding. It's a very strong intermolecular force. So only nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine can participate in hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonds are very strong intermolecular forces. They're much stronger than dipole-dipole or dispersion. Um, 
and substances that have hydrogen bonding will have higher boiling points. But hydrogen bonds are not nearly as strong as covalent bonds. So when I look at um, this picture here, these are covalent bonds that hold the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms together. These are the hydrogen bonds that hold these molecules together. Okay, so this molecule is held to this molecule with hydrogen bonds. This, these right here are hydrogen bonds. But those are only 2 to 5% as strong as covalent bonds. The bonds that hold O and H together, these bonds are incredibly strong. And think about it. When I heat up ice, what happens? Well, the bonds right here in between water molecules break and the solid H2O turns to liquid H2O. When I add even more heat, even more kinetic energy, what happens to the water? Well, these bonds right here break and the liquid particles break apart from each other and they turn into gaseous H2O. When I heat gaseous H2O and give it even more kinetic energy, what happens to it? Well, the temperature of the steam just goes up and up and up and up and up. And you can get steam to be really, really, really hot, like thousands of degrees. H2O can have so much kinetic energy that it will be thousands of degrees hot before you start to break these bonds. The bonds between the O and the H, the covalent bonds, are incredibly strong. We turn the water, we turn the ice into steam, that's pretty easy. But turning H2O into just H and O is very hard. Covalent bonds are very strong. So here is an, an example that shows us the difference between dipole-dipole in interactions and hydrogen bonding. So this molecule down here has a dipole-dipole. This molecule up here, even though it has the same exact atoms, the atoms are arranged in a different way. So when they're arranged this way, I have an H and an O that are next to each other. So this molecule right here has hydrogen bonding, the H and the O. This molecule right here has O next to carbon. So when O is next to carbon, then I get a dipole moment. And when O is next to H, then I get hydrogen bonding. So these particles that have exactly the same atoms and exactly the same mass, but they have different shapes, this one has a boiling point that is 100 degrees higher than this one. 100 degrees, even though they have exactly the same mass. So that shows you that the way that the particles are arranged is very important. Uh, it gives rise to their chemical properties and their physical properties. The O and the H next to each other makes this particle very sticky. This is a hydrogen bond. Here, the O is not next to an H, so this can't hydrogen bond, so it's not nearly as sticky. It has a much lower boiling point. So the last intermolecular force is a little bit different than the others because the others are, part of, are forces that a pure substance can experience in between particles of a pure substance. But this force, the ion-dipole attraction, this is a force that generally occurs in mixtures. So hydrogen bonding occurs when it's pure water, but when I have water and salt, sodium chloride, I've put salt in the water, now there's a new force that, that occurs. So remember that all attractive forces are just the forces between plus and minus. Even in dispersion and dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding and covalent bonding, it's always plus attracted to minus. Well, it's also plus attracted to minus, in an ionic bond. Here's ionic bonding right here, right? So an ion-dipole force is when I have an ion and it's interacting with the dipole of another molecule. Water is not ionic. Water is polar. It's polar covalent. So water cannot form an ionic bond with an ion. But water can form a bond with an ion, and that's how water dissolves salt. Water dissolves sodium chloride. You put it in water, it will disappear. Because water can pull the plus and the minus apart, because water is also plus and minus. Water has a positive end, the H, and water has a negative end, the O, because these are polar bonds. So bonds that have dipole moments, like H2O, molecules that are polar, can interact with ions. 
Molecules that are not polar, that don't have polar bonds, cannot interact with ions because molecules that are not polar don't have pluses. And if they don't have pluses, they can't interact with minuses. They're neutral. Nonpolar neutral molecules, neutral things are not attracted to each other. Only positive and negative things are. So an ion dipole attraction is the force that occurs in mixtures generally between water and other substances. Here's an ion, here's a dipole. This is the force between ions and dipoles. So here's a table that kind of shows us the difference in the strength of our intermolecular forces. Dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and then ion-dipole. When we summarize them like this, you can see the similarities. It's plus attracted to minus, plus attracted to minus, plus attracted to minus, plus attracted to minus. All the attraction is always the same. The difference is that here, this is, these are really weak. This is instantaneous. weak because it's an instantaneous dipole. It's there in one instant and it's gone in the next. This is a stronger because it's a permanent dipole. Stronger equals permanent. And this dipole is even stronger because that hydrogen can be highly polarized, even stronger because O, N, and F are very electronegative. So these are very polar. And here, I have a full positive charge. So think about this. When something is totally nonpolar, the uh, electrons are shared evenly, H and H, right? I've got these electrons and they're shared evenly. That's nonpolar. Something that's polar that has a dipole looks like this, where those electrons, hold on, where those electrons are not shared evenly, they're closer to the more electronegative atom, like Cl. So then Cl is minus and H is plus. Um, with H2O, they're even closer to the O, right? That's really, really close to the O now because that O is so electronegative. So sometimes I say this is partial, partial minus, partial, partial plus, right? No charge whatsoever, nonpolar. Partial plus, partial minus, that's polar. Partial, partial plus, partial, partial minus, that's really polar because it's OH and O is so electronegative for hydrogen bonding. And finally, if I have Na and Cl, then it's so polar now that the Cl Right, has completely stolen the electrons away from the Na. So look at what happens when I have a difference in electronegativity. Perfectly shared, closer to the more electronegative atom, even closer to the more electronegative atom, completely stolen by the electronegative atom. So what happens in that case when there's a bigger difference in electronegativity? No charge, bigger charge, even bigger charge, biggest charge full plus and full minus are bigger than partial partial plus and partial partial minus. So when we look at these, this, the strength of these intermolecular forces, they're the weakest when they're completely nonpolar because there's no charge on any of these particles. The intermolecular forces get a little bit stronger between particles that have a dipole moment the intermolecular forces get even stronger between particles that have even bigger charges that are really, really polar. And the intermolecular forces are the strongest when particles have a full charge. Although I should catch myself by saying this is not an intermolecular force. This is ionic bond. The intermolecular force would go like this between a dipole like H, which is partial positive, 
and Cl minus. So this force right here would be ion dipole between the ion and the dipole. This is the strongest force of all. Now finally, if we were to add our covalent forces here, then we would go dispersion, dipole dipole, hydrogen bond, ion dipole, and then way, way, way down here, way down because they're much stronger. So the much stronger forces will be ionic bond. And ionic bond is between full plus and full minus. And finally, covalent bond. Covalent bond is the strongest. Triple covalent bond is the absolute strongest. And covalent bond is where I share the electrons. They're shared. There is no uh, uh, partial, po partial plus and partial minus. So ionic bonds and covalent bonds are far, far stronger than any of these forces. But they're always, all the forces are similar in that it's always plus being attracted to minus.